My name is Sherry Wallace. I'm a PT by training, and I am the clinical research specialist for Bionic Labs. I'm currently in sunny Philadelphia. Our man manufacturing and research space is in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And I'm joined today by Kate Adele from Bionic Labs, located in Denver, Colorado, and John Carlo Levrio from Post Acute Medical in Dover, Delaware. To be sure to get your questions answered, please submit them via the Q&A button if you haven't already submitted them ahead of time. We, have an we will answer at the end of the presentations. Any questions submitted via the chat feature will not be addressed. As with all webinars, there isn't always enough time to get to every participant's questions. So if your question doesn't get answered, we will follow up with you via email. I would like to now introduce you to Kate and Giancarlo, who will be our presenters today. Kate Adele is an occupational therapist with clinical and clinical specialist for Bionic. Kate has nine years of clinical experience with complex neurologically impaired patients in a variety of settings. Kate's leadership role in a large healthcare system sparked her passion for advanced robotics and technology for rehabilitation. Dr. Giancarlo Levrio is a doctor of physical therapy with his degree from Gannon University. He is also a graduate of Lock Haven University with a degree in athletic training. He currently serves as the Director of Rehabilitation at Post-Acute Medical Rehabilitation Hospital in Dover, Delaware, and has experience in the outpatient, acute care, and inpatient settings. Throughout his career, Giancarlo has focused his care in the areas of neuro rehab, specifically traumatic brain injuries, vestibular dysfunction, and movement disorders. Giancarlo has stated, quote, those individuals who have been affected by brain injuries create a unique treatment opportunity from a physical, occupational, and speech therapy perspective. Every patient is so different with what systems are affected. So being creative and focusing treatment on function and engaging them in activities they enjoy make our jobs as therapists so rewarding, end quote. He also serves as the head athletic trainer for the Delaware Thunder Hockey Club. So Kate, at this point, I will turn it over to you to start our presentation. Thank you, Sherry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm so excited to be able to connect with you virtually. Just a little background on our company. Bionic is a rehabilitation device company. We supply, we supply evidence-based technology solutions for movement impairments. Our robotic assisted therapy systems are intended to restore upper extremity movement and function for patient conditions and diagnoses, including stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, and other neurologic impairments for a broad range of recovery stages, acute through chronic. If you had the opportunity to join us last week, you know we've kicked off our clinical webinar series, and today we're opening up, pun intended, with spasticity and robotics. As Sherry mentioned, we would love for this to be an interactive experience, so please think of questions or discussions you want to add to the conversation, and we'll have an opportunity to address these. Additionally, you'll be able to find these webinars on our website. So we'll begin today by discussing spasticity, what it looks like, how it's typically treated. Then we'll dive into some exciting interventions with our robotic systems, and briefly touch on the benefits of our evaluation and reporting system. And then we'll get to speak with John Carlo about his facility's personal experience with the device and patient treatments. Now, before we can dive into how robotics can help with spasticity, we need to know what it is, what it looks like. I'm sure every clinician logged in today has a story or a patient example that involves spasticity and part of their treatment plan was managing it. Physiologically, spasticity is a motor disorder consisting of a velocity-dependent increase in those stretch reflexes or muscle tone with exaggerated tendon jerks. Now, this results from a hyperexcitability of those stretch reflexes, one component of the upper motor neuron syndrome. We think of spasticity as a continuous contraction of certain muscles, characterized by tightness or stiffness, preventing normal movement in the extremities. 
This, of course, has a major impact on how daily activities are performed and can significantly limit independence, safety, and comfort for tasks that are typically simple to maneuver. Walking, eating, bathing, and getting dressed. As we know, there's a variety of conditions and diagnoses that can cause the condition of spasticity. Some of these most common to us are stroke, brain injury, spinal cord injury, and cerebral palsy. Fortunately, we do know a piece of technology that addresses each of these with supported research. So what does spasticity look and feel like for the person experiencing it? It's very common to have muscle stiffness, spasms, painful muscle contractions, muscle and joint deformities, and muscle fatigue. It's an extremely common condition. Spasticity impacts more than an estimated 12 million people globally. Approximately 80% of people with cerebral palsy, or CP, and multiple sclerosis, or MS, have varying degrees of spasticity. Fortunately, there are strategies to help relieve and intervene for this condition. Traditional therapy, occupational and physical, medical intervention, surgical intervention, and of course, robotics. The main priority is usually to relieve those signs and symptoms that are painful and inhibit functional movement. Patients and we as therapists want to improve gait, hygiene, and activities of daily living. And of course, an added benefit to increasing the patient independence is reducing caregiver challenges. Specific therapy goals are to improve voluntary motor movements such as reaching, grasping and releasing, maintaining or improving range of motion, increasing strength and coordination, and improving comfort. In rehab and clinic, we see a lot of stretching, repetitions of purposeful movement, always bringing back that foundational theory of neuroplasticity, and some cases even see temporary splints, braces, casting, and forms of e-stim. As we'll see in just a few moments, there are a lot of combinatorial approaches to manage spasticity and associated pain. And many of those include different types of medication, baclofen, gabapentin, and Botox, for example. The use of oral medications to treat spasticity may be indicated when symptoms interfere with daily functioning and sleep. Botox injections, when used in tiny amounts, have proven effective in paralyzing spastic muscles. Injection sites are carefully determined based on that pattern of spasticity. Injections generally take effect within a few days and can even last a few months. In some cases, surgical procedures may be indicated, such as an intrathecal baclofen pump. To give you a colorful example of a more combinatorial approach to treatment, I want to share a brief video of one of our partners using the InMotion robot in conjunction with Botox. In motion robot for me offers us an ability to do more functional work, to do functional intervention robotically. Um, I push function a lot and uh, we can't be doing therapy just to do therapy. It has to have an outpoint and any technology that assists with getting us to a functional end is, is essential for a high functioning uh, facility. Maria Lee's she had her stroke over 10 years ago. Her story is interesting because we've been focused on the robotics with her. Like she's just responded so well to it that that's what I've done almost every session with her. What brought her into my office was the doctor who did her Botox is Dr. Steinley. That's uh, here at St. Luke's South. And so he said, I'd like you to try this robotic treatment. Maria is my patient and she's somebody that I've been doing botulinum toxins to reduce her spasticity in that paralyzed spastic arm. We've seen some nice improvement incorporating the Botox as part of her treatment regimen for use of the robot. They can work synergistically because with a spastic arm, we can see the arm and the fingers in a flex position. We can break the patient out of that pattern with the use of the Botox the arm helps train that patient while they are having reduction of tone from the Botox. For instance, with the right biceps, she used to hold the right arm in a flex position. Now, 
with her walking pattern, she's dropping that right arm and she walks in a more reciprocal pattern with arm swing, which she was not demonstrating six to nine months ago. It, it has directed my brain to force my arm to reconnect with the movement. It is very difficult to, um, to explain. For example, I don't know that I am making jerky movement until I saw, I saw it here. I have power now in my arm. I could open the door and I can close the door. Yesterday I was in a doctor's office and I, uh, there was a magazine and I couldn't reach it, but I could scoot it close enough that I, I could grab it by, with my left hand. I don't know how many times she said, good point, or you did well. I ponder sometimes, well, does she say that because of, of, because she is supposed to say that, mm -hmm. or because she, sees uh, an improvement and it on it is only when I saw the report uh, of at the end that well yeah I, she was right <laughs> I am so pleased with the combination of the robot a uh, robot and my therapist, because it is very good. Uh, <laughs> I just love watching that patient. So if your patient has a similar presentation to Marie Elise or even more limitation due to spasticity or tone, there are specific features on the InMotion robots that can be quite beneficial. For example, clinicians can select from multiple different range of motion settings. This allows for patients with varying levels of spasticity, tone, and even discomfort with certain movements to still participate and benefit from the device. Clinicians can select a smaller diameter range of motion workspace for that individual and then set a goal to increase their range of motion to tolerate the larger diameter as they progress. With the in-motion systems, high intensity and repetitions of movement are also possible within just one treatment session. But as we know from the 10 principles of motor learning, the secret to successful neuroplasticity doesn't revolve around repetitions alone. Overall dosage matters, the greater, the better in those early phases of recovery. Dosage is the number of activities performed, the number of sessions per week, the length of the sessions themselves, and the overall length of treatment. Each of these components needs to be maximized in order to achieve the best intensity. The InMotion eval encompasses measures of motor control, including accuracy, strength, and range of motion. We are able to compare data at a variety of increments, day one of rehab through discharge, that indicates patient progress in each of these areas, which of course relates back to their functional progress. Can I move my cup of coffee without spilling? Can I extend my elbow to get my shirt on in the morning all by myself? It's very crucial today with documentation demands to be able to access data and metrics. The InMotion eval is a powerful tool that we utilize to assist with tracking patient progress as well as documenting accurate information. Range of motion, strength, coordination and movement, and we also have metrics related to an isometric hold and the patient's ability to work against a force. You can see in this patient example, when asked to draw a circle, which is an untrained task, after just two weeks of use with the robot, the patient was able to demonstrate significant improvement. Now, of course, those patient success stories are powerful, but robotics also have the great fortune of being extensively researched. 
Before we jump into some great questions with Giancarlo, I just want to touch on a couple of studies. Now this study here did not include the in-motion systems, but I still think it's a great one to look at now because of the combination of robotics and Botox, just like Dr. Steinle so greatly explained. The first here includes 32 chronic stroke patients in an outpatient setting with, of course, identified upper extremity spastic hemiparesis. This was a five-week, 45-minute daily session, twice a week research study. The robot-assisted training was proven to be as effective as conventional training on muscle tone reduction when combined with Botox in the chronic stroke patients with upper extremity spasticity. However, only the robot-assisted training contributed to improving muscle strength. Now in this study, the in-motion devices, or the robots formerly known as MIT Manus, were utilized for the study. It had 34 participants having had an acute event at least one year previously, and notable exclusion criteria was flaccid hemiparesis. Participants were divided into two groups. Both groups used the robot, but were asked to do different movement patterns. The second group was specifically directed to complete movements that would reduce stimulation of a flexor pattern in an effort to compare motor impairment and pain from people completing movement patterns in all directions versus limiting movement that would stimulate a flexor pattern. Comparison between the groups confirmed that active movement training did not result in increased hypertonia, but did result in spasticity reduction in those antagonist muscles. Additionally, the robot-mediated therapy contributed to a decrease in motor impairment of the upper limbs in those subjects with the chronic hemiparesis, which resulted in a reduction in shoulder pain. After therapy, the results again showed that significant decrease in motor impairment in the upper limb paretic group and passive range of motion in the shoulder also increased in both groups. Uh, one thing that we like to note is that at admission to this trial, 13 subjects had shoulder pain. At the end of the robotic assisted therapy, 10 had a reduced pain score and no one reported an increase in pain score. So the results indicated that the in-motion robots were effective for spasticity for chronic stroke and pain reduction. And we always love those follow-ups. At three months, there was a follow-up performed and improvements were found in both groups after treatment. All right, now I'm excited to bring Giancarlo into the conversation. And don't be frightened, we will turn our, our cameras on now so you get a little more interaction here. Hi. Hi, okay. Kate. Hi, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, we do have a few questions that have been submitted in advance. And then following these, we'll jump into the Q&A form to address anything that's come in during the live audience portion. Um, and again, just a reminder, anything that we don't get to on this um, webinar, we will absolutely follow up with you via email. So Giancarlo, thank you again for your time today. Um, we will get started with the first question here. Um, but before we jump into full-on questions, can you just give us a little background on yourself, your clinical experience, and your facility? Sure. Uh, so I am a PT by trade. Um, I'm currently the director of rehab at Dover uh, Pam Rehab Hospital. Uh, so we are one of 18 rehab hospitals in our system across the country. Uh, we have 34 beds here at our facility with an attached outpatient clinic. Um, the majority of our patients that we see here are, um, it's probably about a 70% uh, caseload mix of, of mainly comprised of uh, neuro-based patients. So our TBI, strokes, Parkinson's, MS, CP, um, and that's in both clinics. Um, our outpatient clinic typically caters toward the, the more neuro-based uh, population. We still see our orthos, but neuro is kind of our bread and butter here. Awesome. So then why did you choose uh, this device to add to your treatment program? So our corporate um, office, uh, when we opened last February of 2019, um, had purchased the robot for our facility. So we currently have the uh, arm uh, robot. So it's a, a piece that we have here in our, our inpatient side um, and our outpatient clinic obviously uses it. But our, our main component of, of picking that piece of equipment was really the outcome uh, reporting with it. You know, we really liked having the objective, objective data right in front of us where we can pull that report, um, 
we can put it in our notes to help with uh, gaining you know, additional time or justification for treatment. Um, but we also use that as an education piece so that when we can pull our reports up, we can show our patients, hey, this is where you were first session, um, specifically with that circle and the, the point to point. Um, those are usually pretty good ones that, that most people can understand and, and can relate to. And we use those as an education piece that to help them show that they're making progress because a lot of times when we're seeing these patients, excuse me, our, uh, our population is, you're seeing very small gains over, over the course of, of a day or two. And, and a lot of times mentally that, that it does affect your patients. Sure, sure. I love that point you brought up about being able to show them right away. Um, I don't know if everyone on, on this webinar knows that the reporting system, you can instantaneously pull up so you have a document right in front of you, you can print it, send it to your medical record and have that evidence there, which is great for us as clinicians because I can have that objective data, see what progress is being made. But it's also great for those patients who maybe need a little bit of encouragement or some visual evidence like, hey, you are getting better, this is working, your therapy session is, is working, that's great. So how have you utilized the device maybe specifically for spasticity? Is the treatment look different than treatment for just typical weakness or other conditions? Sure, so we, uh, we do use it for a lot of our patients, again, with our, our populations with uh, bringing that, that TBI, CVA, CP kind of mix. Um, you know, as we, as we kind of show in the research, the etiology and, and especially in brain injuries, um, and that, again, I'm kind of partial to brain injuries here with, with my treatment approach. Um, uh, the etiology is usually around 50% um, show some sort of spasticity, whether it's um, new, whether it's underlying, or maybe it's a comorbid condition. Um, so we do use that. Um, you know, one, one area that we really like is, uh, you know, kind of strengthening the antagonist groups. Um, that's shown a lot of, of really good uh, results because now you don't have as much kind of overflow into one side of the, of the muscle groups um, to work on that. Uh, plus, we're able to use the uh, use the robot kind of as a, as a second clinician, if you will, um, where I don't have to have my hands on them performing that task. I can get my hands, um, you know, maybe on a shoulder scap, uh, the shoulder stabilizers, the um, trunk itself to give them some cueing. Um, I might look at doing some body mechanics with it or um, some mobilizations while I'm going along. Um, and again, you guys can see. See, I'm, I'm Italian, so my hands are moving. Um, so I, I really like getting my hands on my patients. I feel like I get better cueing with that. Maybe some, you know, non-traditional biofeedback. I can get modalities in there. Um, and again, my treatment approach is very much kind of from the inside out. Um, I really like using, you know, trunk stuff to, in order to work, you know, periphery um, and kind of build off of that. Um, I, you, that's a great point, and I, I always like to remind myself that you're a physical therapist, I'm an occupational therapist, and so it's so fun to hear how your goals with the device may be completely different than my goals, and we'll forgive you for, for being in the PT field, but um, what other kind of, you know, we talked a lot about combinatorial approaches, and I don't know if you've had patients that have been able to get some of those um, medication effects too, but what other kind of combinations are you using with the device? Say it again. What kind of? Yeah, I did, what what kind of combinatorial approaches are you using with the device? I know you said a lot of hands-on therapy. Oh yeah. So uh, the nice thing is we again we can really kind of focus where their big deficits are, um, and with having the robot, you know, I can I can potentially get you know three four hundred reps um, in the course of a treatment session with them. So now as I'm I'm moving along, instead of me doing maybe thirty or forty five or even fifty if I'm stretching at reps of P and F or passive range or maybe some, uh, you know, isometric stabilization exercises with, especially with my shoulder patients, um, you know, I can now get the robot involved, have them do the reps for 30 minutes, increase that number of reps, kind of get double the therapy in that 30 minute period. And then I still have time, you know, in the second half of that session that we have, uh, at least on the inpatient side, uh, to really translate that, that task from the robot to a functional activity. I love it. That's great. It's a, a good way to show how the dosage maybe can be different to, between patients, between settings where, hey, sounds like your focus might be, let's get the repetitions, let's get that exercise component, and then let's go take it to the kitchen or to the hallway where we can do some functional movements um, based on 
what we just practiced with the robot. I love it. The next question um, asks about a specific patient example. People love to know, of course, the clinician background, but um, we want to see, hey, how does this help your patient? So I know you sent us a little short clip um, just with this patient using the robot for a few seconds, and then we'll jump in and have you maybe give us a detailed background of this patient and his presentation and how the device helped. So here we go. New form of um, what do they call it? Games. <laughs> Specifically for you. Good job. So I want to get to the EV rep march. Almost there. Okay. Yeah. Makes you think about what you're doing. So I don't know the service side and all that, but in session. All right, so all right, tell, tell us uh, all Walt about this came character. to us, uh, status post, uh, rotator cuff repair. Um, so Walt, in addition to his left uh, rotator cuff repair, uh, also came in with congenital CP. Uh, so his left arm was his now dominant arm, uh, even though naturally he's right-handed. Uh, so his right arm was really, really affected with tone. So when he would walk, uh, he was in a flex position. Um, he really wasn't able to use that arm to do anything outside of maybe pin some items against the body if he was carrying some papers or a towel or his jacket. Uh, so he we really kind of focused his treatment with the robot on gaining some use of that limb, even though that wasn't really his primary reason for being in rehab. Uh, so Walt uh, lived at home with his wife. Um, his wife wasn't really in the greatest of health, so she wasn't able to help a lot. So the majority of what we tried to focus on was gaining Walt's independence with his right arm. Um, and you guys can see in that video that when he was on there, he was using the arm and hand, um, so it was out. He'd have to open his hand, bring it back. Um, so that worked a, a lot of, uh, you know, compensatory movements in addition to just the the shoulder and the and the elbow work. Um, he was also working on on a grasp at that point. Um, so Walt finished up with his inpatient rehab, uh, ended up coming back to us for his outpatient, um, and traveled a, a decent bit. You know, he was he was a good probably thirty to forty minutes um, one direction to come back. Uh, and that was really the only reason that he came back. Um, he wanted on the robot. He was on it every day that he was on the inpatient side. He was on it every session. He was here an outpatient. Um, and, it, you know, his word of mouth with going to his church and his neighbors and his family and friends, well more than half suited with what we needed uh, from him. You know, we were happy that he was gaining you know, mobility and, and use of that arm, but you know, he kind of gave us in return almost free marketing because of, of his kind of testimonial and, and going out and he was in essence a shining star for us with, uh, you know, telling everybody about how great the robot was and, and what all he was able to accomplish after, after being on it. That's awesome. I like the, the free marketing. That's great. Now, he, if he's on here, you're going to have to start paying him. But yes. <laughs> I think another thing that speaks volumes is yeah, he was willing to come back with that continuity for him and for your clinicians to, to maintain that relationship and also for him to continue to use the device so that you could keep seeing that objective progress with, um, with the reporting system. That's great. So tell us how you utilize those reports and the metrics. Do you find them beneficial when you're discussing with between each other as clinicians, um, with your staff, with the physicians, and then also with your patients? Yeah, we do. Um... So the nice thing is, especially when we transition from our inpatient to outpatient, uh, we're able to go and take those reports and our therapists can say, hey, this is where you were when you left on Tuesday. It is now you know, Friday of that week. Maybe it's the beginning of the next week. We can see where he was at when he left at the last session. Um, sure. So then picking up and, and creating that uh, continuity care with you know, his treatment plan and his goals kept everything really, really nice in line. Um, our, our therapists, when we have PRNs that are coming in and out, they know how to use it. So now that treatment protocol then continues uh, to move on from clinician to clinician without 
losing any sort of gap whenever you have maybe a new therapist come in, a different therapist that's treating because of schedule limitations. Um, and then we also use it a lot when we are when our uh, team conferences uh, that we do weekly, where we can go and say to the physician, hey, we're seeing gains here with, you know, the north, south, east, west directions. Um, and it's translating to his ability to perform this functional task. Or um, again, from a PT side, maybe I don't necessarily have to work on, on reaching into a cupboard, but now I can see his gait pattern is improving because he does, he's not holding his arm up you know, at his shoulder in this flex position. It's, it's down a little bit, so now I can see his balance is translating a little bit. So if you kind of break out of that, that focus of, I'm a PT, I only work on the legs, you're an OT, you work on the arms, if you can intermix that, there, there are a lot of things that an OT can do for the legs that translates to what they need to do with ADLs, with functional tasks, with um, cooking, those kind of things that, and the same thing with a PT, there's just because they can't walk, you know, what's the root cause of it? Is it because their balance is so impaired because they don't have a weight shift now? Is it because they aren't able to grasp an assistive device? You know, what, you know, kind of what is our, our overall gain here? Um, yeah. And that's the nice thing about the robot is we can use that, you know, again, as a PT, I can use that to function in another area, not just on use of that, that limb. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big uh, advocate of not separating my arms and legs, but that's a whole other soapbox. We don't, we won't get on that. Um, but the team conference is a great point at my previous facility. We would meet for even just 10 minutes for each patient. And as a fellow Italian, I can talk and talk and talk and use my hands, but this is a great way to focus, hone things in and say, hey, here's the evidence. I've got it right in front of me. This is what we need to keep maximizing their time here and their progress before it's time to go home. It's a really great point. Yeah. And we love, you know, the insurance companies love that objective data. They don't, they don't care about what you think they're going to do or what they can do. They want to see clear cut and, and the, the reports from the robot are very clear with, you know, this improved from point A to point B. And you know, now we're still seeing gains as we're, as we're going along. We can justify, especially with the patients that, with our brain injury patients that are maybe lower level, um, we're able to go and add, you know, that piece where we're still seeing gains, but they're not these larger gains on this GG scoring that, that the insurance companies are necessarily looking for. Sure, sure. One of our um, partners has actually had success in submitting the reporting system to insurance for their outpatient clinic and the patient was granted more visits after previously being denied. And this was a woman that was years after incident. So um, really impressive. So thank you so much. I, I know in the interest of time, we want to jump to some of the live questions. So um, Sherry, I will, I will turn it over to you to help us moderate these. Absolutely. And thanks both of you for a wonderful discussion. Um, and we've learned quite a bit, so thanks. Um, so our first question is to Giancarlo. How long do you have to see the patient on the robot to see a decrease in spasticity? Well, so when we, when we look at our treatment protocols um, and, and we look at our scheduling with our patients, typically we're seeing them for, at, I would say at the minimum, about 60 minute sessions. Um, we try not to do the 30 minutes, it's very hard to get uh, patients involved or, or kind of gapped in unless they're, um, you know, there's maybe a higher level function that we can get some tasks out of them. Um, but typically we do about an hour session with our patients on the inpatient side, and between an hour and an, and an hour and a half in our outpatient clinic. Um, so we're using the robot, you know, probably about a third of that, so 30 minutes or so, um, to you have it set up, you get the patient on it, um, you can get your reps in and out of it pretty quickly and, and then translate that function. Um, you know, we've seen some patients that improve over the course of of four or five days if, if we're getting them on and, and we can get a second session where they're maybe getting 60 minutes on the robot versus just that 30 session. So now we're, we're increasing that, that number of reps. Um, we're increasing the, the ability for them to perform a task and really kind of hone, hone what they're able to do on that. Um, so typically inpatient side, we're seeing at least five days a week. Um, we try to keep that protocol pretty consistent. Um, in outpatient, you know, it's at least three times a week when they're on the robot. If they're in for a session for outpatient for whatever reason, they're on the robot um, using it. Um, ideally, if, you know, if we had the ability for some folks, you know, to get that sixth or seventh day, um, we, have, we have done that. Um, but typically, we're on about a five-day schedule. Wonderful. Thanks. Kate, have you seen anything different than that in the field? 
Yeah, I mean, John Carlo has a great example of, a, of one of our partners using it, and I appreciate, you know, his inpatient facility. Like, we know they, they're there seven days a week, so sometimes a little bit easier to get access to patients. But, you know, as we know, and as we talked about earlier, it takes thousands of repetitions to induce that neuroplasticity. So the devices allow for clinicians and patients to achieve over a thousand reps in a session. So it definitely varies depending on the patient's goals and how long, how much time the clinician has with with each patient. Great, thanks. Um, so do any of the patients that you've seen, Giancarlo, in, the, in practice, do they have to, or do they struggle with spasticity and pain when they're on the robot? Uh, not from the robot specifically. Um, a lot of that really ties back to um, maybe their body mechanics or that pressure that they've got because of that flex posture and that, that autonomic response that they've got. Um, the nice thing is with, again, having the robot being there as that second clinician, I can then get them on to a modality. Um, I might be able to cue them with their body mechanics, uh, with their trunk posture. Um, I can get you know some e-stim on them to help with, uh, with creating a little less tension or maybe doing some, some NMES with them to do some muscle re-add. Um, I can also go and get you know some hot cold modalities on there um, to help them do it as a, as kind of a prep for treatment. Um, but from the robot itself, no, we're not getting any responsive pain to it. It's really coming down to kind of their position and, and what they started with before they got on there. Great, um, Kate. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I really appreciate this question. Um, of course, if a patient's having any pain or discomfort, then it's definitely a good time to pause, see if there's any repositioning that needs to happen because no, that we, we don't, don't want to induce any pain, of course. Um, fortunately, if there is spasticity or tone that's a factor in achieving range of motion or discomfort, then um, you may recall that there's quite a few different settings for range of motion and positioning on the devices. Not only can you move to a smaller range of motion workspace, but there's a variety of forearm positions and hand positioning capabilities on the device to be in a little more supinated or pronated position as well as um, wrist and uh, grip function. So luckily there's lots of different options where you can really cater it to your patient specifically. Wonderful. So we have a question coming in from Samuel. Um, my facility has the InMotion 2 robot, which limits with lower functional level being able to use it. We treat acute stroke patients as early as five days post-stroke. How beneficial would it be to upgrade to the current model? Um, I'm actually gonna take this one to start and see if the other two of you have anything to add to it. But basically, um, you, I can give you the good and the bad. The, the bad news first is that if you have an older model, both Kate and I probably have never seen it. Um, because we have not been with the company and the company has been around for 20 some years and there are still devices in the field that people are working with um, from 20 years ago. So the good news is, is that the devices last forever. However, in the current situation where you're describing that you're using the device early in rehabilitation, again, the good news here is that the current device can be used that early and effectively used that early. Um, you don't have to have movement at all to use this device and you can progress all the way up to the patient um, needing to have resistance to get further strengthening. So the nice thing is, is there are no requirements for the current device um, to use it as far as ability to move like there are with some of the upper extremity robotic devices. Um, Giancarlo, in your experience, have you seen any patients that are too, quote unquote, too flaccid to use the device? No, uh, no, because the nice thing about the robot is if, if they're not able, or the patient's not able to initiate that movement, um, the robot will pick up and and help carry them through um, with what they need to do. Um, plus the other nice thing too, is you have that isometric hold. So even doing, um, like having them on where maybe they are a little more flaccid than, than we would like to see, 
getting them on where they can even start to stabilize a little bit with that isometric hold uh, program that's on the machine, um, you know, we can we can start to initiate that. It's it's no different than if you would have someone, you know, supine and maybe their arm kind of up at, at 90 degrees of a flexed shoulder position where maybe you have them doing a co-contraction back and forth. Um, yeah, we might do it with uh, an inflatable sleeve uh, to give them that elbow extension and help with some of that, um, you know, proximal stability. Um, but the, the robot does allow for that to, for them to still function without having necessarily full movement of that limb. Yeah, good point. Um, Kate, anything that you've seen that you might add to that? Yeah, I, I think what Sherry meant to say was, yes, absolutely, you want to upgrade to the newest device, <laughs> absolutely. But no, the, the device was designed for the severely impaired patient. So it's absolutely appropriate for those days after, and the research supports that, so um, absolutely. Yes, and you are quite right. I did mean to say, absolutely you want a new device, only because there are other things that the new device, the new um, incorporation of the device. Now, the same technology goes into, obviously, the functioning of the device, but there are new things that are available both in the protocols and um, within the comfort of the device, to be quite honest, that are big improvements over what um, was used as research devices previously. Um, yeah, so, we're yeah. Always improving. yeah, we're always improving. We're taking feedback from our customers, from the patient. So um, the, the software, you know, is, is much more beautiful than, than it was 20 years ago, I'll be quite honest with you. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have another um, question coming in from the field along with a comment from Avriel. So great point to Giancarlo of using antagonistic movement patterns and also doing hands-on interventions simultaneously during robotic treatment, highlighting the in-motion system's ability to, or important tool in decreasing spasticity. Um, to Dr. Levrio, in addition to using the bionic objective evaluations, have you thought about utilizing a clinical gait evaluation, both pre and post robotics, to show how performing repetitious arm training with robotics can be beneficial to functional ambulation. So yeah, so we when our patients come in, we're we're typically doing some sort of gait assessment, whether it's a uh, timed up and go, whether um, you know it's it's the four step box test, it's a five minute walk test. Um, we're still utilizing that, but we're not tracking any of that research, um, you know, as we go along. So subjectively, we can see that they they do make improvements with it, but you know, are we tracking that data and you know potentially researching it? We're we're not right now. Um, I think that's that's something that you know we could potentially partner with Bionic in the future to to look at doing. Um, to again, you know, kind of see that it's this non-traditional approach that you know we don't need to separate you know what we're doing per discipline. Like we. Our goal ultimately between, you know, our PTs, OTs, and speech therapists that, you know, our goal is to get that patient home and to, and to improve their function, um, regardless if maybe we're doing an hour of balance with PT in this way and we're doing an hour of balance with OT in this way. We're still trying to work on the same goals. Uh, it's just how we're achieving those goals and what, what tools we're using to do, so. Yeah, and the interesting point with that is that, you know, if you've addressed every other aspect of someone's balance, and they're still having falls and they have an offset posture because of an upper extremity that's causing a problem, why wouldn't you address that um, as a PT or an OT? So you have a really, really excellent point there. And I think it is an underserved area um, of treatment for both disciplines, to be quite honest. Kate, anything um, else to add to that? I'm outnumbered here as the OT, so I'm going to leave the uh, the PT assessments to you and the gate assessments to to the two of you. <laughs> nice, nice job. I love it. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about how to use the device to drive neuroplasticity. Um, Giancarlo, can you talk a little bit about um, any of the other protocols that you used um, to address treatment goals? other than um, spasticity, just a little bit on, you know, some other treatment issues that you've run into. 
Uh, yeah, so, you know, again, we do carry uh, some ortho in our in our population and, and we work with our ortho partners in our community um, to help establish with what, what protocols they're comfortable with us using um, the robot for. Because again, you know, especially after a rotator cuff repair or uh, a reverse total shoulder, you know, those are things that, you know, orthopods really have specific protocols for. So, you know, we're still using the robot for them. Um, you know, they might be something that maybe we're doing, and, you know, I brought up the uh, isometric strengthening earlier. So now we're, we're really working on that stability component. Um, you know, there's uh, another uh, program that's in it. It's not necessarily a protocol, but it's uh, the squeegee. Um, and our patients really like doing that where you, you put them on and they have to kind of clear the screen. So now not only are we using just a, a you know, one direction where we're going either in a circle clockwise, counterclockwise, point to point, that's kind of our building block for that. We're now able to use that squeegee as a, as a treatment um, in order to kind of put everything together um, and kind of wrap up with what they're doing with each individual um, assessment or protocol. Thanks, John Carlo. Um, so there is another question, um, and this one is very specific. So I'm gonna send it out there to you. If you have an answer to it, great. If you don't, um, I will take this one on as well. So have there been correlations between changes on the circle or point to point assessment and um, the modified Ashworth scale? So I'm not asking you for um, obviously data related to research, but have you seen changes in the modified Ashworth scale when you're seeing changes on the robot? Uh, so, yeah, it's very specific. Um, we actually have a patient now that came in as a very, um, very low level um, brain injury um, due to an anoxic injury. Uh, and we have seen, we actually use the JFK scale for this, this patient. So we've seen uh, a correlation in, in her progression with what she's able to initiate um, on, the, on the robot and how much the robot has to pick up uh, in order her, for her to complete the task. Um, and again, this is kind of anecdotal. Um, but we have seen an improvement with kind of where she started with the JFK and where she's progressed through that. Um, and, and we can kind of tailor it and see it where, you know, this is where she was with, you know, day one and then day five and then day 10. And we can do, we do see that, that improvement, but again, that's very anecdotal. Thanks for that. Um, so in, in tr a true answer to this related to research, there is a correlation that has been done by, the, um, by researchers related to the device, and that is a correlation to the Fugelmeyer scale. However, the correlation is at a level of 0.7, so it's not the best correlation, um, but it is a correlation that is reported from the device. As far as doing a true correlation through research to um, from the point to point of the circle to uh, reduction in the modified Ashworth score. That research has not as yet been done, but it sounds like it would be an interesting research project for somebody to take on. Um, so hopefully we can um, promote someone doing that in the future. Um, so last question that we have is, would you discuss some examples of using the robot to maximize patient engagement? And are there any specific protocols um, that help with that? And this one I'm gonna to send to Kate first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Giancarlo kind of hinted at some of them earlier when he was talking about the squeegee. Um, there's obviously the set, we, we refer to them as additional activities and they're a little more engaging, a little more um, colorful, which is great. I sometimes will use them as a rewarding system. Like, hey, let's go get 300 repetitions in our typical assisted uh, protocol and then we'll jump in and do something a little more fun like playing the the four-way pong or, or doing the squeegee but there's also multiple protocols that can be affiliated with whatever your goal is with your patient so I'm obviously much stronger than Giancarlo I need to have a much higher strength component in order to work on my um, my movement so I can go to the resistance protocol and move against multiple different settings I can grade that activity as my patient gets stronger, we can move up to a higher resistance level. When we're talking about spasticity, maybe we are trying to focus on specific movements um, outside of that typical flexor pattern. So um, I might utilize one of our fan protocols where all of my targets 
are in the northern hemisphere or in the east or the west hemisphere depending on which arm I'm working with. So those are those are a few examples of some variety of protocols in addition to the typical move in all the directions where the robot kicks in when needed to provide that assistance. Thanks for that. And Giancarlo, any final thoughts from you? No, I think Kate summed it up pretty well. She, uh, she, you know, she had the good points about, you know, kind of using, using the robot as a reward because it, it really is uh, outside of, you know, the normal, hey, we're going to sit and work on some sit to stands or we're going to work on, you know, some squatting and your, your mechanics. It gets the patient engaged with, without them thinking they're doing therapy necessarily, especially with a lot of the kind of other activities that are, that are provided on the robot. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Kate, any final thoughts from you? No, I just wanna thank everyone for jumping on and participating today and a special thank you to Giancarlo. We really appreciate your personal insight and, and your partnership with us in your facility and your time to do this. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you guys for having me. Thanks so much everybody for joining us for our presentation on spasticity and breaking the barrier with Giancarlo Levrio and Kate Adele. Our next webinar will take place on May 19th, 20th, and 21st, and will address the topic of driving therapy with robotic data and bionics in motion system. For more information about bionics in motion robotic systems, please go to our website at www.bioniclabs.com, or you can email us at kadell, spelled K-E-D-E-L-L, -L, at bioniclabs.com. This concludes our webinar and thank you for participating.